Welcome to Fun and Games Side Quests. Every episode is a different host sharing a video game they love and why they love it. Hey everyone, I'm Case Aiken, and you might know me from other shows on this network or previous appearances on Side Quests, or if you're really in the know, I happen to be the editor for the Side Quests animated videos that we put up every week uh, to correspond to the series. And I wanted to take a minute to talk about a game that I really loved as a kid. And I think it honestly kind of gets buried in conversation about a franchise that's kind of been forgotten. And that's Mega Man 3. So the Mega Man series is technically still going. There was a recent game in the series a year or two ago that was quite fun. And the series in general is usually on every retro collection that has been put out by Nintendo because it is just a popular series. Mega Man 2 was on the NES Mini. Mega Man X was on the Super NES Mini. The series is not truly forgotten, but it kind of feels like it is sometimes. It's changed in a lot of ways. And considering that it felt as foundational to Nintendo-style games as Mario or Link, it does feel like it is not as appreciated, despite its pedigree. But people do talk about it when they discuss retro games. And that's kind of because it happens to be Mega Man's Star Trek 3 The Search for Spock to Mega Man 2's Star Trek 2 The Wrath of Khan. And what I mean by that is that the original Mega Man game was kind of a false start. It had a format that was somewhat different from the format we would get with later Mega Man games, uh, such as having eight bosses and a more consistent design towards the, the final sections and any boss rushes and so forth. Mega Man 1 had a score system. It had a lot of strange uh, game structures. It had a lot of vertical levels, which were not a good idea in that control scheme. So in general, Mega Man 1 was not a big seller. Mega Man 2 was done in secret because a sequel was not greenlit and they just took the assets and made an amazing game out of it. And yes, it's amazing. It's also not the first Mega Man game I owned, but it is the first Mega Man game I played. So when I was a kid, my neighbor had a Nintendo and we would borrow games from each other and we would uh, explicitly try to buy games opposite what the other one had so that we could try things out. My friend picked up Mega Man 2, and this was mind-blowing to me at the time. The idea that you could have a game where you could take damage and not lose your projectile weapon, because I was so used to both Zelda and Mario at that point. I was a kid. I'm sorry. Anyway, so I really wanted to get Mega Man 1, because it was Mega Man 2, so I knew there was a first game, and I, I begged for Christmas to get it, and uh, I didn't get it. I instead got Mega Man 3, which was a game I didn't know existed at the time. So I'm opening up this package being like, oh, my God, it's Me oh, it's Mega Man. Wait, it's a different Mega Man game. And then trying to convey that I was so excited to my grandmother that this game that I did not know existed prior to this moment. And I w was trying to be like, no, it's the new one. This is fantastic. It's maligned somewhat because it was rushed in terms of production schedule as opposed to Mega Man 2 and Mega Man 4, where some more time could go into it. And because the main additions to the game are subtler ones, uh, this is the game that introduced the slide and this is the game that introduced Rush, the robot dog assistant to Mega Man. But the slide is not as big a mechanic in terms of actual gameplay as, say, the dash and Mega Man X. Um, so while it allows for some maneuverability and some ability to avoid attacks by going to a lower level than you are normally positioned, it's not quite as important to the gameplay loop as, say, the Mega Buster, which was introduced in the following game. And likewise, Rush, while very cool, had an analog in both of the previous Mega Man games. Mega Man 1 had the special weapon platform power that you could pick up in a Lechman stage, and Mega Man 2 had several gadgets that you could pick up over the course of your game that would allow you to have additional mobility in all the ways that Rush ultimately provides. What Rush does is it personifies, or I guess canifies, the gadgets that you would pick up into a lovable sidekick companion that you could feel emotionally attached to. Also, this is the game that kind of had weird theming in terms of what stages you were getting. In previous games, there was always a pretext of some sort of environment that people would actually be occupying and have robot servitors functioning as labor in that space, particularly the first game. Um, the second game, to a lesser extent, but, you know, here's the water space, Bubble Man, and here's the fire space, Heat Man. Mega Man 3 has some really weird choices. Like, Snake Man has just, here's the snake part of the city, and it's a great level. It's it's gorgeous, but it's so weird. 
And the game has been criticized for some of the design elements, but it's also a huge game with more boss encounters than I think any other Nintendo Mega Man game. It has a gigantic number of levels. And while it doesn't have a proper prologue animated sequence like Mega Man 2 or 4 have in different formats, it does have a really comprehensive conclusion. And so when you beat the game, if you're not that versed in Mega Man lore, or if you are for that matter, you are treated to a rundown of all the Dr. Light made robots, which is really cool. If you didn't realize that there was a distinct difference between robots built by Dr. Light in the first game and ones that were built by Dr. Wily in the second and third, this is a spot where you can kind of find out some of that lore. It also explains this recurring character that's been showing up in starting in this game, who at the time was called Breakman. But we would find out that it is Proto Man. It is the prototype to the robot that would be Mega Man. And this character is so cool. I adored the concept. And it's kind of a fun jab at the original construction of the Mega Man games where they wanted to have the character be red. But for color palette issues, they made the character blue. Playing on the musical elements that the game always invokes, uh, particularly in the Japanese setting, where instead of Mega Man, it is Rock Band, which is both a reference to rock, paper, scissors and to rock and roll. Uh, The character is called Blues, which is also a forerunner to rock and roll. So I love this character because it's the Racer X type. We all know this type of character exists and we just fucking love it. It's the same situation with the Green Ranger on Power Rangers. We love having this sort of like later introduced mysterious, you know, Lancer type character. Uh, Likewise, Wolverine coming in and being sort of the bad boy on the X-Men. We like that archetype. And Proto Man provided that for this series. And he would continue to be a major character in the series that we got. And then is obviously the direct inspiration for Zero in the Mega Man X series. As far as weapons go... It is hard to compare to Mega Man 2 because the Metal Blade was so good and so much fun for players to get. This game understood that it was overpowered and tried to move away from that in more restrained power sets. Few of the powers are standout winners. They are all situationally useful with cool effects. The Gemini Man 1 stands out for me because it's the first boss that I beat in the sequence that I figured out, but I don't know if that's actually the right sequence. This is a game, of course, that is in the Mega Man series, and so having hard sequential order is important to how you take down the bosses. You also get a lot of bonus content. I mentioned that there are more boss fights than any other Mega Man game for the NES era, and that is because you actually fight all of the bosses from Mega Man 2 as well. The way it's set up is that there are these uh, sort of standardized robots that have the programming of the Mega Man 2 bosses uh, uploaded into them, so we you have this sort of stock robot that you walk into the room and then there's a sequence of the sprite for the Mega Man 2 boss that floats down into it and infuses it, kind of possessing this entity. I don't know why they couldn't just take the assets from the previous game. It is probably for space reasons because I don't believe you get any animations from the Mega Man 2 sprites, but you still get basically the same boss fight with some changes in hitbox size and they're in levels that are modeled after the Mega Man 3 bosses. But it's still fun to face off against them. And frankly, most of their weaknesses kind of match up to what they would have been in Mega Man 2. So things like bosses that are weak to the Metal Blade, you can use the Shadow Blade on type situations. The last thing I want to focus on is how broken Rush was in this game. In later iterations, the Rush Jet would always move forward when you were standing on it. Uh, But in this game, you actually had just full flight. You could just go whatever direction you wanted. And while it burned power, you could... If you knew how to get power ups to keep it charged or you just knew what you needed to do, you could pretty much go anywhere in the game once you acquired this power up. It was huge. And in a game that was defined on a running to the right mechanism, all of a sudden having full movement inside the screen was a massive change in the gameplay loop. So while Mega Man 2 is properly credited as the game that actually launched the series in the public consciousness. And Mega Man 4 is well-remembered because it introduced the Mega Buster and lots of the gameplay elements that would then be transferred over to the Mega Man X series. Mega Man 3 is a good game, and it's a really good game in a series of really good games. By virtue of being so similar, the Mega Man games are difficult to rate necessarily in terms of like which one is actually better as opposed to which one is more creative when looking at it. Mega Man 2 obviously stands out just because of its point in history. And Mega Man 1 has really iconic boss design. Mega Man 3 continues to have good design, 
but typically doesn't stand out as much. Likewise, Mega Man 4 is generally considered just a solid game, but with the age of the series starting to show. Mega Man 5 is usually thought to be too easy, but has, for my money, one of the more fun stories in the series. While Mega Man 6 is usually thought to be the weakest of the series, but that's mostly because of how iterated upon the style of game had become. So I guess what I'm saying is that Mega Man 3 is a really good entry in a really good series that they just don't really make like they used to. So check it out. If you like lore, this is the game that really brought it into the actual gameplay and not just in the instruction manuals for the games. If you like cool level design, there's some really beautiful ones. There's some great bosses. It doesn't feel as tired as the later games in the series feels. And while there are some aspects of the game that are not as polished as its predecessor or immediate successor, it has a spark of creativity in its design and is just a really fun game overall. It is a worthy successor to Mega Man 2 and one I just wish more people talked about. So again, thank you for going on this journey with me. Again, I've been Case Aiken. I am a producer on the Certain POV Network that this show is a part of. In particular, you should check out my shows Another Pass and Men of Steel, as well as check out the videos that we're putting out on our YouTube page, which I have a hand in all of that. So check out all those things, and you can find that all at CertainPOV.com. You can find me on Twitter at Case Aiken. Uh, And until next time, happy gaming. Hey. Oh, hey, Jeff. What's going on, guys? Oh, you know, talking about Superman. Oh, cool. I could talk about Superman. I could talk some more about Superman. We know. I'll bet a few people would want to get in on this. I'm down. You know it. That sounds like fun. I'll do it. Cool. Let's do it. We can call the show Men of Steel. And you can find it at CertainPOV.com. Or wherever you get your podcasts. Yay. All right, Josue, let's go through our new comic day stack. We have a lot to review. I know. Maybe we've gone too far. Well, let's see. Marvel, of course. DC. I got Image. Dark Horse. Black Mask. Boom. IDW. Aftershock. Vault, of course. Mad Cave. Oni. Valiant. Scout. Magma. Behemoth. Wow, that's a lot. Oh, well, all we need now is a name for our show. We need a name for a show about reviewing comic books every week. Something clever, but not too clever. Like a pun? It's kind of cheesy. Yeah, it's something that seems funny at first, but we might regret later on as an impulsive decision a few dozen episodes in. Yeah, we'll think of something. Join Keith and Osway for We Have Issues, a weekly show reviewing almost every new comic released each week. Available on Geek Elite Media and wherever you listen to your podcasts. CPOV CertainPOV.com